one of the least effective ways of helping to bring people into the fold or getting more people to think differently about these issues is haranguing them, is screaming and yelling at them and making them feel bad for the way that um, they might do in their life. But I understand that type of zeal. I understand that as a young person, when you come into a different life philosophy, you come into a different way of thinking about things, there's a moment when you have that type of zeal. But So I wanted to start with that song, though, because I just wanted to take you on a journey about why these issues are so important to me and why I want you to at least think about these issues if you haven't. And if you do think about these issues, if you're already committed to creating a more healthy and just and sustainable world, if you're already committed to eating in a way that has the least impact on the planet, the least impact on other animals, the least impact on the you know local economies, then I want you to think about creative ways that you can take this message back to the people that you love, who might not be thinking about these issues, and help to change their habits and attitudes and politics around these issues. You know what I'm talking about? Like, what's our goal? Is our goal to be right? Is our goal to be smart? Is it to look, you know, holy or not? Or is it to really change people and get them to think more deeply and change their habits, their, their attitudes and habits and politics, right? That's my goal. Like, what is our real goal? My goal is to get people to really think differently and then move to action. So part of my whole philosophy since I started doing this work back in 2001 was start with the visceral, move to the cerebral, and end at the political. Because I think it's important for us to realize that when we talk about these issues, a lot of people are invested in personal transformation, right? I want to make different changes as a consumer. I'm going to spend my money, you know, I'm going to understand that every dollar that I spend is a vote for the type of food system I want to see. So I'm going to shop at Whole Foods, or I'm going to shop at the farmer's market, or I'm going to shop and spend it with local farmers. And those things are important, right? We need to be supporting local growers, right? We need to be, like, expressing our politics through our dollars, if we believe in capitalism. But, um, <laughs> or at least if we're participating in it. But the thing is, I just want people to understand that consumer action is not enough. We can't just stop with consumer action. That's not going to transform the food system. It's not going to move the needle. And what we need to understand is that there are public policies in place that prevent small farmers from thriving. There are public policies in place that allow the most wealthy multinational corporations to get these huge government subsidies and make fast food and junk food and processed food so artificially cheap that it's easy for poor people to just you know, survive off of those things. So we need to engage in public policy. We need to let our elected officials know that we want them voting for uh, you know, a food system that benefits all of us, the people, right? Regular or ordinary people and not just wealthy corporations. Are you guys feeling me on that? It's up to us. We need to be civically engaged, right? And that's not the only thing because clearly for a lot of us, it's clear that we may not get justice from um, the state, but we need to at least engage in um, trying to make public policy change. And if you don't know about it, please check out the Farm Bill. You know about the Farm Bill? The Farm Bill is thing that comes up every so often that determines a lot of policies around these issues. So we need to be engaged in those things. But I want to talk about why I started doing this work, kind of moving from this personal transformation that I had in high school and how I started getting into this work politically. So much of the work that I do as a food activist, because if you don't know, before I started writing books, I was a grassroots activist in New York City working around these issues uh, with young people. And so much of the work that I did around these issues was inspired by the work that was happening right here in the San Francisco Bay Area in the late 60s and the late 70s. You guys heard of the Black Panthers? Right? So I would argue that the work that the Black Panthers were doing back in the 60s and 70s um, was a precursor to so much of the work that we understand as like food justice activism today. I was in graduate school, I was in a PhD program in history at NYU, and my research was looking at this transition from the civil rights movement to what we kind of see as the black power movement. And I was so, just, I was taken aback by this brilliant analysis that the Panthers had back then that looked at this analysis, this kind of intersection of poverty, malnutrition, and institutional racism. So if you don't know about the Panthers, I mean, a lot of people have heard of the Black Panthers. They, they kind of understand them in this way that the popular media constructed them to be crazy, gun-toting radicals or, or militants, right? But the thing is, the Panthers had a number of very vital community programs that were addressed at just transforming low-income communities in the Bay Area, working class, working poor communities. So they had a number of programs all under the rubric of their survival programs, which were aimed at just empowering 
low-income people. It's like, how can people be um, self-determined? How can people own and drive the solutions to the problems in the community? So two of the programs under that rubric were their um, grocery giveaway. This is the late 60s and the 70s, where the Panthers were giving away groceries, food, to poor people who couldn't afford to feed themselves and their families, right? Without any government subsidies, without any, um, you know, half a million dollar grants from the Ford Foundation. They weren't getting institutional funding, but they were doing it just off of pure desire to transform communities. But the program that moved me more than anything else was their Free Breakfast for Children program. Have you guys heard of this program? Free Breakfast for Children program started in 1967 by the Panthers with the help of a reverend in West Oakland, California. And this program was simply aimed at feeding young people breakfast every morning, right? I don't know about you guys, if I haven't eaten any breakfast, I could barely put a sentence together. Imagine being a young person going to school, trying to assimilate what you're learning, and you have to eat. So they started this program in 1967. Within one year, every major chapter, every major city that had a chapter of the Black Panther Party replicated this model, and they were feeding over 10,000 young people every single morning. 10,000 young people, right? Guess what? When the FBI files were declassified, a lot of the COINTELPRO, you know, the files about the way in which the government was trying to undermine these radical movements. <laughs> J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI at that time, said the most dangerous program that the Black Panther Party had was the Free Breakfast for Children program. That was the most dangerous program, them feeding children every morning, right? So, you know, thinking about this larger social movement and all these issues that I have worked on and many of you care about, from police brutality to failing infrastructure to horrible public schools to fair wages, whatever issues you're working on. When you think about the communities that are most impacted by these issues, these are the same communities. And this is something that I discovered when I was in grad school. But I was also part of an activist community working on dismantling the prison industrial complex. And it occurred to me that these communities, these most impacted communities, are the same communities that statistically have the highest rates of preventable diet-related illness, heart disease, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, many low-income, working class, working poor communities of color, right? Guess what? If you walk around those communities, there are very few sources of access to healthy, fresh, affordable, culturally appropriate food. And the, the, the plethora of the, the opposite, right? Lots of corner stores, bodegas, lots of fast food restaurants. You guys know what I'm talking about? Have you been to certain parts of West Oakland? Have you been to certain parts of East Oakland? If you don't know what I'm talking about, let me just paint a picture for you. When I moved from Brooklyn, New York to uh, Oakland in 2008, I lived right over there. It's an apartment building tucked behind the trees over there, but right across the street from Lake Mary. A couple of blocks over from where I live, there's this like independent old grocery store. You can get organic greens, you know, some bulk grains and beans, just whatever you need to pick. They had it, it wasn't necessarily cheap, but they had it right there. You know, if you go maybe like 10 minutes around the lake, you get the ginormous 40,000 square foot Whole Foods, right? It has lots of bulk grains and greens and organic produce and lots of horrible, crappy stuff that they market as healthy and I still buy it because they make it look so good like it under the lights. <coughs> and some of it's really good. But don't buy stuff just because it says vegan on it, okay? That's gonna be a whole other stream. We're gonna get to that. But vegan is one thing, but eating a healthful, whole food, plant-based diet is a whole other thing. So don't be fooled by the corporation. They know a lot of people are invested in moving towards more healthful diets, and a lot of that stuff that they're kind of marketing is vegan. It's really not. It is. But anyway, I digress. Point is, if you continue around the lake, Saturdays, Grand Lake Farmer's Market. Anybody shop at Grand Lake Farmer's Market? Amazing farmer's market, very family friendly, lots of immigrant farmers, you know, low income women farmers. So in this one community, there's just like an overabundance around this lake of, of sources getting healthy, fresh, affordable food. But if you go to West Oakland, which is about 10 minutes away from the Whole Foods, back in 2008, they did a study that showed that there are 58 corner stores slash liquor stores in West Oakland, right? And we know what they have. Lots of processed foods, packaged foods, high in salt, high in sugar, high in fat, low in the desirable nutrients that we need, you know, particularly children. But, and lots of alcohol and tobacco, depending on which one you go to. How many supermarkets do you think they had in West Oakland back in 2008? 
not one single supermarket, right? Not one single supermarket. And to be clear, I don't think a supermarket is a marker of food security in a community, but I think every community deserves a supermarket, right? We're not growing olives and producing olive oil in Oakland. You want to get some olive oil, you want to get some condoms, condiments, you know, certain things that you just need a supermarket for, right? And so, you know, statistically, this is one of those communities that people talk about because they do have such high rates of preventable diet-related illnesses, and it's described as a food desert. So I'm going to tell you why I have a problem with this term food desert. I think that the term food desert is, is important for kind of helping to identify communities that might have very few uh, resources for healthy, affordable food as opposed to more affluent communities that might have an overabundance. But I think it takes agency away from the people who are living in the communities and producing food and doing things like growing the food from a homeland. I mean, you have people from, you know, different um, immigrants from Southeast Asia, you know, people who are coming from the South who are still growing, you know, fruits and vegetables and herbs from their homeland. So to say that it's a food desert, I feel like it just erases a lot of the vibrancy and brilliant ways in which people are trying to maintain this connection with their cultural foods and growth. But the point is, the reality is we know that there are not enough sources for people getting good food in these communities. And so I just feel like as an African-American who has a national state of a platform and a position on a national state, it's important for me to think about ways in which I can give voice to those communities and ensure that resources, energy, and um, you know, upliftment is being funneled to those communities. And, but it's not about me transforming those communities. It's about me thinking my ways, how can I support people in those communities to be in charge of their own death, right? This whole idea of owning and driving the solutions for community food security, because we're in the Bay Area, whoa. Watch out, there's some stuff happening over there. Be careful, the back folks. Um, so, So the thing is, you know, I think about, and, and I just, I, I need to say this because I'm in the Bay Area, and I know a lot of people who are invested, like, they're like, I want to be a food activist. I've been thinking about these issues. I'm invested in changing communities, so I'm going to go to one of these poor communities, and I'm going to make sure that I help to, like, make sure that everyone has access to healthy, affordable food. And so one of the issues that I think often comes up, and I just want people to think about the power dynamics of working in collaboration with communities because, you know, when I think about like the early 20th century and like social worker, that whole in the kind of like emergence of social work as a form of like this field and how it was almost, you know, it was like you had the more affluent, educated, often, most often white women who were kind of going into these poor communities, immigrant communities, you know, African American communities kind of patrolling the boundaries of class and policing the behavior of poor people, right? I see this happening and come on kind of replicated the food justice movement. We have a lot of well-meaning, altruistic, brilliant, smart people going into communities with a desire to transform it, but they don't come from these communities. And they're not respecting the inbred, not the knowledge, the desire to, to change. Like the people in communities know what the problems are. They know strategies for fixing them, but they need resources. So I'm just saying this, that's kind of my digression. If you want to transform communities, let's make sure that we're shifting power. Let's make sure we're working in partnership with communities and not coming in and replicating these forms and oppressing people with this idea that we're helping them when we're really just making ourselves feel good and we're kind of, you know, supporting this not-for-profit industrial complex where we just like sit in these cushy jobs and not-for-profit EDs and not ensuring that that little boy who's in that community who probably, you know, has very little food on the table is one day going to be the executive director of the organization and not just someone who's giving service. You guys know what I'm talking about? I got to say it. It's important for us to think about these issues. You got to dig deep. You got to peel back the layers. It's not some service BS we're talking about. This is real talk. So, <clears throat> get my coffee. <laughs> Much work I'm gonna have. Okay, good. So I just want to end with this. I, well, you know, I kind of want to. So you know, we talked about this idea of like, you know, just having like this transformation internally, 
and then we talk about the politics and this whole issue around race and class and intersections and like lack of access to affordable food. But you know what? I realize that these things might not mean very much to a lot of people out here. A lot of people in this audience might have access to every type of food source they want. You know, people here might, you know, I'm sure, like a lot of you might live in Walnut Creek. You have a farmer's market, you have a Whole Foods, you have a Safeway. So why should you care about the poor people in West Oakland and their relationship with food and the fact that they have very little access to healthy food? I get that, that's a fair argument to make. But moving from just me being like this crazy militant like vegan who wanted everybody to like change their thoughts and attitudes about food and become vegans because I understood the horrible way in which animals were treated in factory farms because I understood the impact that we have on the environment when we eat in this like meat-centric standard American diet to being like invested in the food politics of these issues and wanting to transform communities and wanting to empower low-income communities of color to be more food secure. This is where I'm at now. I'm a parent. I have a four-year-old daughter. I have a nine-month-old daughter. And my wife and I are deeply invested in trying to ensure that we create a world that they, they can inherit that is actually vibrant, sustainable, and alive. The thing about supporting an industrial food system, the thing about supporting it, kind of like maintaining these standard American meat-heavy diets, is that we're supporting a runaway food system that is actually destroying the very foundations of a, health, of a healthy food system. You know, we're talking about like a, a, a food system that's going to be unsustainable in the next 20, 30 years. But the reality is the multinational corporations that are, you know, running these factory farms that are spraying chemical pesticides in the earth, in the air, in the water, they are destroying the very foundations of a habitable earth. You guys know what I'm talking about? They are poisoning the water, they are poisoning the air, they are poisoning the soil, and we are going to leave this earth for our children and our grandchildren in far worse condition than it is now. And things are really bad now. I mean, we know about the drought happening in California. We know about the ecological chaos happening globally. But we have the opportunity to do something different. We have an opportunity to reel in this runaway food system and to tell our policymakers, to tell these corporations, no, we need this to stop. We are not going to allow you to continue to make profit king and, and um, you know, just ignore the way in which it's affecting this living organism, this beautiful earth. I mean, thank God. They've been resuscitating this beautiful lake. Because let me tell you, when I moved here in 2008, before I was like, getting heavily gentrified, this was like an SHIT hole over here. This is not as beautiful as it was now. But <laughs> I guess my point is, we have the ability to like change things. We can reverse it. We can reel it back. And it takes us. It takes our voices. It takes us starting with this personal transformation, this individual revolution, evolution, what have you. We need that. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to in any way um, devalue the importance of all of us having this individual transformation. When I, when I started doing this work, I, I founded an organization in New York called Be Healthy. Build healthy eating and lifestyles to help you. We work with young people from the lower economic strata of New York, New York City, mostly African-American, Latino, Afro-Caribbean. And so we did this two-year program. The first year was just about helping them transform their thoughts and attitudes and habits around food. We wanted them to really believe this and buy in. We brought them in the second year with the understanding that most of the social movements throughout the, many of the social movements throughout the 20th century, young people, brilliance, their vibrancy, their energy, was so vital to the forward movement of these, um, these different movements, whether it's the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, whether it's the civil rights movement in the American South. So I argue that if we're talking about transforming the food system, we need to train a cadre of young food activists to take the lead. We have to do that. But at the same time, you guys feeling that? Invest in these young people. And there are a number of organizations in Oakland that are working with young people. Oakland, Berkeley, the East Bay, San Francisco that are working with young people. We need to invest in them. But um, that first year, we would just have this, you know, we bring them in for the second year to have like advanced training and political education, organizing, community activism, all these things so that they can go into their geographic communities, their schools, and their other communities, their faith-based institutions, and work towards change around food. But the first year, 
was about them just having an individual transformation. And I think that's vitally important. We need to help our friends, our family, the people that we love, the people in our faith community, the people in our schools, the people in our workplaces. We need them to understand this. And one of the most powerful ways to do that, I argue, is by making people a delicious meal. You know what I mean? Because people have this perception that vegan and vegetarian food is like bland, boring, and disgusting. It's like, you know, some hippie food that people in Ber Berkeley wear in Birkenstocks, like brown rice with white tofu with brown sauce over it. And we know that's like the old school 70s macrobiotic style of vegetarian and vegan cooking, but now we can, it's like really delicious. You guys have been to Gather, Millennium, um, s and like Caterers, like there's some amazing stuff happening out there. So making delicious food can be a powerful way to just transform people because they can see that, oh yeah, you can have food, it doesn't have to have meat. You can have food that is actually, you know, when you get it from local sources, it actually tastes so much better than food that's been shipped across the globe or shipped across the country. So that, part, that piece is important. But then we need to move from that individual transformation. We need to encourage our family and friends to move from that individual transformation to community action. How can we engage our schools, our faith-based institutions, our um, community organizations that we're part of to really get on board to this food group? How can we like have this massive groundswell of folks and communities to transform it? And then lastly, what can we do to ensure that the people who we're putting in office, these public officials, are making policies that are uh, benefiting the earth, that are benefiting everyday people like me and you, and not just the wealthy corporations and not just the wealthy one percent. So. I thank you, I hope that inspired you, and I hope you have a wonderful day.